Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, so as I mentioned in the announcement that I sent out, uh, we're going to do something a little different this week. Obviously, we're all on Zoom. Uh, what I'll do this week is, I mean, I'll, I'll start off discussing something, some topics relevant to the, uh, the lecture materials. So I'll Today, I'll start off talking about some movements in the futures market. Uh, then I'd like to see where you guys are in terms of your knowledge of futures. So what I'll be doing is I'll be asking you to use the uh, serv a service called Poll Everywhere. And uh, actually, why don't I share my screen so you can actually see uh, what you'll need to do. So this week, just to help me get a sense of where you are and make it hopefully a little more interesting, uh, what I'd like you to do, if you have Poll Everywhere already, it, perfect, here's the login information. But if you don't, Poll Everywhere is a free app that you download and it allows you to essentially uh, respond to a poll that I put out. And so for this class, I'm going to cover the qualitative questions via poll everywhere and then you know see where where we stand uh, and then you know I'll, I'll harp on why some of these answers are correct some of them are not and then uh, so if everyone has the right answer I might just say good job and move on uh, but uh, if at any time you have a question, please feel free to just ask it out loud or send me a private message. I think I should be able to see any private messages coming through. I've got dual monitors here, so hopefully I, I can see what you guys are, uh, are asking. So uh, with that being said, why don't I just... Uh, so I'll mention the article I wanted to show you today, and then while I'm doing that, if anyone doesn't have Poll Everywhere, uh, if you wouldn't mind just downloading that, and then uh, we'll, we'll cover the assignment here in a few seconds. So the article I wanted to show you guys today relates pretty strong, uh, it is pretty relevant to, well, futures currently. So it, this was one of the, the articles that came through in the Financial Times in last week or so, uh, but basically Hershey's. Uh, is like a lot of companies, they need to purchase inputs to produce their chocolate. And so historically, Hershey's, just like a lot of companies, just goes out and buys the, the actual commodity, so cocoa, uh, from various places around the world, various companies around the world in, I mean, since cocoa is produced primarily in emerging markets near the tropics, uh, typically they'll go to countries like the Ivory Coast, or Nigeria to purchase uh, cocoa. And the issue with this is the same issue with a lot of commodities. I mean, there, there are many commodities out there where the supply is controlled by, well, a very small number of suppliers. So in this case, as you uh, might notice if you read through this article, two countries actually produce about 60% of the world's cocoa. And those two countries are going to be uh, the Ivory Coast and Ghana. So they're, they're, those are two countries on the uh, basically not, I mean, if you look at a map of uh, Africa, uh, it's very close to the equator. Very, both these countries are pretty close to Nigeria. Uh, but uh, essentially, both of these countries have started imposing uh, premiums on the, the price of cocoa beans. And so this is a pretty big issue given that these two countries, they, I mean, about 60% of the production of cocoa, which is one of Hershey's primary inputs, uh, comes from these countries. And the cocoa that is produced from these two countries is viewed as being higher quality than the cocoa produced from by firms in other countries. And so as a result, Hershey's has, as we can see in the first line of this article, taken the unusual tactic of buying cocoa on the futures market. Uh, so what they're doing, what Hershey's is doing, is it's buying up futures contracts 
And in this case, I believe, uh, yeah, right here, it's mentioned that the, uh, it's implied that Hershey's is buying uh, futures contracts that expire in December. So what this tells us is that Hershey's, they're, they're locking in the price they'll pay for cocoa. And in December, on the third Friday of the month in December, because that's when all futures contracts uh, expire or mature, uh, whoever has the other side of this contract is either going to have to pay cash or they're going to have to physically deliver cocoa to, well, in this case, it'd be someplace in New York, a physical location. And the price of a futures contract as of the writing of this article was $2,915 per ton of cocoa. Uh, now, there are a couple of things I, I probably should say. I mean, hopefully you had a chance to watch the lecture videos. So you, you should have a sense of the fact that when you buy, when you enter into a futures contract, that futures contract is, is I mean, it's, it's pretty, not to use a, another food reference here, it's vanilla. I mean, each futures contract will be in a certain, it'll have a certain size, it'll have a, a certain delivery type, so either physical delivery or uh, in the form of cash. Or, uh, a lot of these contracts will specify the quality of the product, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, but es essentially what we're seeing here is that because Hershey's has been buying up these futures contracts, the futures price of cocoa has been bid up uh, to the point that uh, the, the value of the contract of a futures contract maturing in December has increased by about 20%. Uh, so here is the physical representation of the price of cocoa uh, per ton. So uh, these cocoa prices or futures contracts, they'll trade on a variety of exchanges. ICE is the intercontinental exchange. Uh, but as you can see, this is the result of some issues with the uh, with cocoa restrictions. Uh, now, there were a couple of other things I wanted to point out here, uh, but oh yeah, I guess the one big thing I the final thing I did want to point out is right here. Uh, so there's a lot of information here that I could say or talk about, but uh, essentially when you have, when your firm is dependent on one commodity, whether it's cocoa for Hershey's or uh, Brent crude oil uh, for, let's say, a, a refiner or even further down the value chain, uh, let's say an auto manufacturer like Ford, uh, a lot of times that those commodities are produced in one physical location or a set of physical locations. And so those producers have a lot of market power. And so uh, the, the reason the Ivory Coast and Ghana have been uh, increasing their price that they're charging to buyers of cocoa is to offset essentially the cost of living. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, they're essentially having farmers Charge, uh, charge a higher price. Well, th the countries are charging a higher price or a premium on the price of cocoa to compensate farmers for a higher cost of living in the Ivory Coast and Ghana, as opposed to say Senegal or uh, Nigeria outside of Lagos. Uh, so that's the first thing here. The second thing here is there's a difference between buying the physical commodity and actually entering into a futures contract. When you buy the physical commodity, uh, a, com a company will often have much more flexibility in identifying you know, the exact product they wanna buy. I mean, they'll be able to specify the exact amount. Maybe it's not uh, one ton, maybe it's uh, half a ton. It, the company will also, in many cases, inspect the product before it's delivered. However, with uh, futures contracts, these things are, they have set amounts and they have, in many cases, set quality. So there's a certain quality standard, but anything beyond that standard doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as this cocoa is of 
a certain grade or maybe a certain color or uh, maybe it, there's some other characteristics that can be quantified here. Uh, that, that essentially fulfills the contract. So the issue that a lot of uh, futures contract purchasers or people who, or companies that take the long position on futures contracts have is that, I mean, quite frankly, they don't have as much control over the quality of the product or the commodity that they're receiving. All right, so uh, that's pretty much the article I wanted to show you. Uh, so with that being said, I mean, why don't I just get into our assignment questions for the day? So like I said, I do have a poll everywhere. So let's try this poll everywhere and I'll, I'll see where you guys are in terms of uh, your knowledge of the lecture material. So again, here is my login information. So Reza Houston 603. And then you can just uh, select your answer choices and we'll be able to see uh, how many people actually buzz in and then we'll see what the actual responses is so, are so you can compare with your classmates. So the first question in the assignment is, which of the following is a possible delivery method for a futures contract? I guess I, I did already mention it uh, to some extent in the last 10 minutes, but A, deliver the physical assets, B, in cash, C, neither, or D, both. I'll give you about, we'll say 20 seconds to buzz in. And I'll take a very deliberate sip of coffee. See how many people we have in the video. Okay, so okay, maybe six is eight is a pretty good uh, percentage. Okay, yeah. So let's see what we have. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I there are sometimes when I I do a poll everywhere uh, where I just think, yeah, that was that question was a little too easy, but. Uh, this is a question where I'm glad everyone got the right answer. So, okay. Next question. Uh, what are most futures contracts used for? Uh, based on lecture material, I, I, I have mentioned two uses for uh, options and futures in the past, but one of these methods or one of these purposes is used far more frequently uh, by traders. So. Is it hedging risk, speculating on stock prices, speculating on physical asset value, or portfolio diversification? Another five seconds to buzz in. All right, let's see what we got. Excellent. Okay, so some diversity here. Okay, yeah, so let's, I, I'm glad no one said, uh, Portfolio diversification. I mean, there's really, I, I, I don't think I've ever actually mentioned that, but yeah, you, you don't really use futures contracts to diversify your portfolio, especially as an individual investor. And uh, speculating on stock prices, I, I had to fill out a fourth choice. So I literally just created a fourth choice here that I, I guess doesn't really make sense. Uh, speculating on physical asset value, you can. The issue that we have here is that a lot of the speculators are typically, they're small time investors, or maybe they're, they're a mutual fund or a hedge fund that's making a very small bet. Uh, in terms of the amount of futures contracts being bought, however, I mean, speculators really represent a very small portion of the market. The larger portion of the market is actually driven by uh, businesses and other organizations trying to hedge against downside risk. So if you're an, let's say, I know I've given this example in the past, but let's say you're a producer of, or, or let's say a, 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 the CFO of an airline, uh, say JetBlue or Southwest or Delta, and you want to decrease the risk 
uh, or the, the downside risk of a rise in oil and thus jet fuel prices. Well, what you can do is you can take a long position in uh, futures contracts on barrels of Brent crude. And so if the price of oil goes up, you profit on those futures contracts and the, that profit will offset the, the additional cost to your firm of an increase in the price of jet fuel. So the overwhelming majority of uh, futures contracts or the volume or dollar value futures contracts goes toward hedging of risk. Uh, it's really only nuts like myself or maybe hedge fund managers that tend to speculate on physical asset uh, value or commodity value in the real world. And we're, we're really small, uh, small time. So, yeah. okay. uh, next, based on the information in the lecture uh, video, what is the size of each futures contract for corn? Uh, so I, I did mention a couple of commodities. Uh, corn, I think I mentioned for the longest amount of time, but uh, yeah, so like I said, these futures contracts, they're all for, I mean, any futures contract for a certain commodity is going to be of the same size. This allows many different producers to actually take a position in a commodity and then be certain that they can actually deliver on said commodity. Uh, so that's why we have common sizes and common quality for these, these uh, commodities or the, these futures contracts. Okay, so let's see what we have. Okay, perfect, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I won't even bother with one bushel or a thousand bushels. Uh, actually, we'll just talk about 5,000 bushels. So uh, the correct answer is 5,000 bushels. And uh, actually, let me just show you, I mean, so there are many different futures exchanges out there. Uh, as you hopefully saw in the video, the big futures exchange is the CME group. Uh, they have been over the last 30 years, they've been buying up others, other futures exchanges. So it started out with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and they merged with the Chicago Board Options uh, uh, trade, so uh, options exchange, so SIBO uh, and then CBOT, and then they over the over time they've bought up smaller exchanges. So the CME group. What I'm trying to say here is, I mean, if there's a futures contract, they're going to trade it, and the rules that they set are going to be, I mean, it's it's a case that they have a massive, they just have massive market power. If they change the nature of the contracts that they allow to be traded, that's going to change. That's going to lead to changes in other futures exchanges. So here, uh, here's corn futures. So correct answer. Like I said, good job to those people who got five thousand bushels. Uh, these contracts they don't trade every month. Uh, they'll typically trade in a couple of different months. So pre. Uh, planting season and then uh, near the end of uh, planting season and then uh, December after harvest. I guess harvest is usually like October, maybe early November at the latest. Uh, but yeah, so uh, correct answer, 5,000 bushels. And so every contract will either involve the trading of an exchange of cash or a delivery of 5,000 bushels to a set location. And typically that set location is gonna be, I mean, if this is on the CME uh, group exchange, like the Sh Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, those 5,000 bushels will be delivered physically to some rail yard in Chicago. If you've ever wondered why Chicago is a very large city and has such large uh, rail yards, or so many, so many uh, railroad tracks, that's the reason. I mean, Chicago is the city for commodities uh, exchanges, particularly of agricultural products in the US. Okay, uh, let us try another one. Okay, so which of the following is the upfront cost of a futures contract? Is it the vigorish or vig? Is it the discount rate? Is it the premium 
or are there no upfront costs to a futures contract? So in the future, no, no pun intended, I am gonna try and find a way to uh, get the rankings up on the side, just so you can see like where you rank relative to your, your classmates as, uh, as the you know, poll everywhere goes on. I, I think that'd be pretty cool, but I haven't figured out how to make that work yet. I, I am admittedly uh, not that good with uh, poll everywhere or Zoom yet. I guess that should come in time, but. Okay, let's see what you have. Okay, yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah, uh, so there are no upfront costs to a futures contract. Uh, the VIG, that's primarily used in gambling. So uh, if you've ever heard of the Vigorish uh, it, the, or the VIG is short for the Vigorish, I mean, that, that's kind of like uh, a term used in gambling. I just kind of threw it in as a distractor. The discount rate, we really don't have uh, I mean, I guess we do have a discount rate when we talk about how to value futures, but I mean, that's not seen as a cost in the futures market. The premium, that's used in options contracts, but we don't have a, an upfront premium in uh, futures contracts. There's really no upfront cost to a futures contract. You, you enter into the contract today, but the only cost come in, comes in at a later date at maturity or expiration of the futures contract when one party is on the hook to deliver either cash or the physical assets. That's the only time cash or commodities change hands. So correct answer, D. Okay, uh, let's try another one. So let's see, you expect the price of a commodity to rise. What trade could you make to profit on this asset? So here, uh, in, in the real world, you have a couple of different ways to profit on any given asset or any given commodity. Uh, now I get to throw uh, futures into the mix. So could you purchase put options? Could you take the long position? Could you take the short position? Or could you sell options on the asset? Uh, sell call options, I should say. Six seems like a pretty good uh, ratio. Let's see what we have. Okay, yeah, uh, perfect. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, put options and selling, buying put options and selling call options, those would pay off if the uh, value of the asset declined, uh, mostly because you know you get the premium by selling the call options, and put options mean that you get to sell uh, your assets for a higher price than they're currently worth on the market. Taking the short position means that you're betting that the price of the, the asset will go down over the period leading up to expiration. Uh, the long position means that you're bullish on the value of this asset. So a, a long position always means that you expect a profit when the value of an asset rises. So the long position on a future futures contract uh, this would be kind of like that case I gave you a few seconds ago where uh, you, you, you buy or you enter into a long position on uh, futures for Brent crude. So if the price of Brent crude rises, the futures price will rise as well. And then uh, you get to buy Brent crude at this price and you get to sell it at the higher price. So uh, really, the the correct answer is the long position on a futures contract. Okay. Uh, just keep in mind, if you guys have any questions while I'm going along here, uh, I can answer any of them. I am trying to do my best to regularly uh, check my chat, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either out loud or via group chat or an individual chat to me, and then I'll just answer the question. I won't even mention your name. Uh, I'll just answer the question to the group. So uh, yeah, let's try another one. Okay, next. Uh, what type of account do you need to trade futures contracts? Uh, so we've talked about a couple of different accounts throughout this class. I realized we mentioned most of these early on in the class, like week two or three. Uh, but 
you, uh, which of these could you, did you, do you need to trade futures? Is it an individual brokerage account, a business account, a margin account, or a custodial account? As I, oh, perfect, nine, we're hitting the high mark. Oh, uh, I don't know if you guys are sitting next to a window, but where I am, uh, so I'm in like Northeast Fishers, it is currently snowing, that is beautiful. All right, uh, yeah, let's see what we have. Okay, uh, yeah, so some serious diversity here. Okay, yeah, so uh, custodial account, I'm glad no one said that. That's for you know the case when you have kids that want to invest. Uh, business account, I hate to say I, I did just make that one up. I, I suppose you can open something like a business account uh, with, a, with a brokerage, but I don't know the particulars of that. Different brokerages will probably have different names for it. Uh, individual brokerage account, you can open an individual brokerage account to trade, but you can't ever trade futures contracts on that account. And the reason you can't trade futures contracts on uh, just a, a regular individual brokerage account is because futures contracts require you to have margin. And for that, you need specifically a margin account. And I, I realize as I'm going through this, there, there are some margin accounts that are individual brokerage accounts. So maybe there are a couple of people that answered that way. Uh, but answered A for that reason, but uh, the reason the correct answer here is C is because at in every single day, uh, you are required to have a certain amount of margin from your broker. Your broker is going to keep track of your margin and you essentially need to have enough margin that regardless of how the market moves in the next day, I mean, futures contracts can only move a certain amount in a in a certain day, uh, regardless of how much you have in your account, you certainly have enough to cover any losses that you suffer in uh, your futures position over the course of the day. So uh, let me see if I, I think I, I did have up here the, uh, yes. I had in the our, our part one of our lecture video, I actually had the maximum amount that different commodities can move every single day. So the daily price uh, limit. So the, the amount that uh, each commodity can move each day. So for example, if I go down to corn again, I guess corn's right here, the maximum amount that it can move per bushel uh, per day is 25 cents. So if the price of corn moves 25 cents upward, then it's going to reach that barrier and it doesn't trade at it essentially trading halts in most cases. So that's, I mean, that's something you should be aware of with futures trading. There is a, a bound on how much those futures prices can move every single day. Uh, but let me get back to this one. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, correct answer, margin account. And that margin account, uh, that, that really is, if you wanna trade futures, more than just having a, an individual brokerage account, typically you'll have to request a margin account from your broker. So a couple of years ago, I actually went through this with E-Trade and uh, I had a brokerage account with them and really opening a margin account was doable, but E-Trade, they actually had me open a separate futures trading account in addition to my margin account. So it was technically a margin account, but it, it, also, it was almost specifically designed to track my futures position. And so, I mean, it, technically a margin account, but I'm, I'm kind of rambling at this point, so let's move on. Okay, uh, which, of the, which is not listed on a commodity futures contract? Is it the delivery month, the size of the contract, the quality of the commodity, or the delivery company? Let's see. Eight, 
Nine. All right, perfect. <laughs> yeah, let's let's see what we have. Oh, great. Okay, yeah. So I, I guess I've really mentioned the size of the contract enough that uh, I, I I think everyone here is going to get that answer right on the final exam. I would guarantee it. Uh, people who don't watch this video or are not on this call, I, I guarantee you probably about a third of them will miss this question or this type of question. But good job uh, not selecting size. Uh, delivery month, that is going to be specified. So if we go back to corn, uh, so I know I haven't let, let it on, but I'm a, I'm a huge Family Guy fan, and I'm just re remembering a cutaway scene uh, with respect to Nebraska and corn right now. But uh, yeah, so uh, the contract will always specify the the month when the contract is due to be uh, to mature. So I mean, if we went into detail, we could even see the day that this uh, this product is or the futures contract uh, matures and the delivery date, if it's a physical delivery, uh, obviously here's the size. And then if we go into full contract specs, we should even be able to see uh, the grade and quality for corn. So for example, for corn in this, I mean, for corn contracts, it has to be number two yellow at the contract price. Uh, I gotta be honest with you guys, I don't know. I'm assuming these are color grades, but I, I, I just don't really know enough about corn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there is a, a grade and quality for most contracts, uh, futures contracts. If your commodity, when you deliver it, doesn't meet that, that quality grade, it gets rejected and you're still on the hook for that product. You still have to deliver it. And there may actually be some penalties for not delivering it by the time that you agreed to deliver it. Uh, so that, I mean, that really means that the, the correct answer here is delivery company. It really doesn't matter who delivers the, the product. I mean, heck, I could sell my, my position on this futures contract to someone else and they could deliver the, the product. Uh, so delivery company is really never mentioned in a futures contract. Uh, so good job to the majority. Okay, next we have uh, soybean futures. Okay, so you're a farmer who believes the price of soybeans will fall during the summer, which is the appropriate way to hedge against the risk of a low price of soybeans at harvest. You could buy call options, you could write put options, you could take a short position, you could take the long position. All right, well, we got five. I realize this one is the downside to futures contracts is that it knowing which position is which is a bit tricky. Uh, it's not like call options and put options where you know, oh, this person wrote it or this person bought it. Uh, it's very clear which way you expect it to go. Uh, but let's let's see what the answers are. Okay, yeah. I, I'd say that is pretty fair. Yeah, uh, when you take the short position in any commodity, uh, you're betting that the price will fall. So the person that takes the short position in soybean futures, what they're doing is uh, they're essentially locking in the price that they will uh, receive when those, soy those soybeans are sold. So essentially, if I'm a corn farmer and I take the short position on soybean futures and the price is, let's say, $5 a bushel of soybeans, uh, what that means is that regardless of how low the price of soybeans falls, I still get to sell my soybeans for $5 a bushel. Uh, so I'm the short position because I believe that the, the price of soybeans will, will fall in the next couple of months until harvest. Uh, someone who would take the long position uh, would expect the price to rise there. Uh, so correct answer, short position. 
name, okay? Uh, let's see. So which of the following is not a primary determinant of currency futures prices? So we're getting into the, the later material now. <laughs> so is it uh, what affects currency futures? Is it inflation, net exports, interest rates, stock prices? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of things that affect currency futures here. Yeah. All right, magic number eight. Let's see what we have. Okay, nice. We have, yeah, a, uh, uh, wow. If we were calculating the standard deviation, we'd have a pretty high standard deviation. I'm okay with this. Okay, so uh, I won't bother with inflation and interest rates. Uh, basically, yes, those two factors absolutely affect currency futures. Uh, another factor that affects currency futures is net exports. So the amount of imports a country is receiving and the amount of exports it's shipping out. Uh, the reason net exports affects currency futures is because, well, it's a supply and demand issue. If you're seeing a lot of your country's currency, uh, well, let me put it a different way. If there is a significant demand for your country's goods, then everybody will want to hold your currency. Uh, let me give you a real world example here. So China has been accused of artificially setting its currency low. Essentially the yuan, the Chinese currency, the renminbi. Uh, right now the yuan is trading at about, oh, six and a half yuan for every dollar. But a large number of exports come out of China. Essentially China is a, a massive net exporter. I mean, it exports hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of merchandise to countries around the world. Well, those countries, when they purchase Chinese goods, a lot of time, a lot of the time, they're, they're, I mean, a lot of the time they're paying in dollars, but a lot of the time they're also converting those dollars or euros or yen into yuan. And so that increases the demand for the yuan. So when a country is a, next, a net exporter, that will tend to increase the value of its currency relative to other currencies. On the other hand, if a country is, let's say, a net it importer, there's not as much demand for that country's currency. Uh, so typically those countries, all else held equal, will see a, a decline in the demand for their currency. Uh, stock prices, I mean, quite frankly, you could argue both sides. I mean, but uh, you know how stock prices might in some limited way affect currency futures, but I, there's not really a strong argument there the way there are with these other three choices. Stock prices really, really don't have a strong correlation coefficient uh, with currency futures. So uh, yes, their stock prices are the correct answer. All right. I'll try one or two more and then we'll probably, I'll open it up for any remaining questions, then we'll wrap up uh, next time with all of the remaining uh, questions that we have. But uh, okay, which of the following allows investors to alter regular cash flows based on interest rates? Uh, is it futures, options, swaps, or forwards? in mind the word regular here. So, I mean, a lot of these will allow you to slightly adjust a cash flow, but there's really only one option here that would allow you to adjust multiple cash flows. Okay. Seven. Good enough for me. All right. Uh, oh, interesting. <laughs> when in doubt, go with futures, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so 
I, I'm actually happy to see this this kind of diversity. Uh, yeah. So the let, let's start with forwards. So I, I haven't really mentioned forwards in uh, too much, just because forwards are so similar to futures. The one thing I should point out, and it's really one of the the few things that you should know about forwards in an intro class like this, is that the big difference between futures and forwards is that futures contracts will trade on an exchange. So they have set sizes and quality grades and delivery time periods. Whereas forwards, they're, I mean, they're priced the same way, but forward agreements are, they're essentially negotiated by two parties and they can come in any shape and size. I mean, you can, as a, company enter into a forward agreement to only buy 250 bushels of corn from a supplier a month from now, uh, instead of just the requisite block of 5,000 bushels of corn. Uh, forward agreements, they give you much more flexibility and they're negotiated individually by, by individual firms. Typically there's, there's a bank acting as an intermediary or go between uh, almost a broker. I mean, they're there are all kinds of brokers for forwards, but a lot of these forward agreements have a bank as an intermediary. Uh, but suffice it to say, forwards are very similar to futures and how they're priced. The only difference is the, the characteristics uh, of the actual contracts themselves. The forwards can be a lot more loosey-goosey with the, the contract terms. Uh, options, well, options, so, this is why I really wanted to mention the, the word regular. I mean, yes, you can exercise an option and receive a certain amount of cash or uh, purchase a certain asset, but there's no regular cash flows changing hands. Uh, so that's why options are not the correct answer. The correct answer here is actually swaps. And I, I realize swaps are probably the thing that I mentioned least in this week's lecture videos, but essentially a swap is an agreement where two parties come to an well two parties into an enter enter an agreement where they will exchange cash flows depending on some change in some asset so a very common swap would be an interest rate swap so uh, I, I think I gave that example in the the actual lecture videos but uh, if interest rates increase, typically one party in an interest rate swap will lock in a set interest rate. And so if interest rates increase, the other party will be on the hook for uh, larger cash flows. A swap agreement allows a, a company to essentially exchange its cash flows or its cash outflows with another set of cash outflows. So if you have, as a CFO of a company, issued a bond that has a variable interest rate and you want to lock down the interest rate that you're going to be paying in terms of coupon payments and face value to the bondholders, what you can do is you can enter into a swap agreement with a, another company and typically you'll be able to lock in a uh, fixed interest rate and they'll take the other side of that contract. So they'll take the, the adjustable interest rate. Uh, that typically is pegged to some, some rate like the SOFR or LIBOR. Uh, so swaps allow you to, as a, a, a company, essentially control the, the interest rate or the, I mean, it could be anything, it could be the uh, swaps on commodities, swaps on, uh, I mean, in some index or something like that, but usually it's interest rate swaps or currency swaps. Uh, but basically, you're, you're just swapping your cash flows with the cash flows of another party. And so you're betting that the position that you took in the case of an interest rate swap of locking in your cash flows uh, is the correct position. And hopefully interest rate rates don't, after the swap is agreed upon, drop significantly and you lose out on all of that, uh, all that interest rate savings that you could have had if you had kept your, your variable interest rate. Uh, so correct answer here, swaps allow you to adjust your, your regular cash flows. So, 
Uh, so I think I'm pretty close to time. Uh, with that being said, why don't I open it up for any questions that you guys might have? Uh, happy to answer literally any question, either about this or the port. Oh, I, I should talk a little bit about the portfolio management project. Uh, so on Friday, we're going to essentially wrap up the portfolio management project and uh, we'll, we'll export your holdings and we'll actually, I'll, I'll do everything I can to make sure that anyone who watches uh, the video tunes in and works through it. Uh, we'll have everything you need to literally just put together a, a Word document and turn it in. Uh, my goal on Friday is to spend most of the class just putting together that that uh, document that you need for the uh, the portfolio management project. And that way you don't have to spend any or too much additional time outside of class on that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, any any final questions? Okay, well, in that case, we'll wrap up here and uh, I'll post this video to our Canvas site and uh, we will come back Wednesday and wrap up these questions. And uh, yeah, I suppose that'll be our, our actual last lecture with new material. So thank you for tuning in.